the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run. 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Ann Foster and today I'm joined by Alice Rutkowski. Alice is the chair and associate professor of English at the State University of New York, Geneseo. I think it's called SUNY Geneseo, but I wanted to explain what I was saying. And I connected with her actually through a friend of the podcast, Kit Hyam, who was on just a few weeks ago talking about the trans Roman emperor Elagabalus. So, okay, I'll backtrack. So one of the members of the Patreon, whose name is Allie, and thank you so much for the suggestion, Allie, said that she had come across some writing or just some blogs about Louisa May Alcott and like a trans affirming reading of Louisa May Alcott's life and work. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. So I contacted Kit, friend of the podcast, to ask if they had come across any readings that they would recommend on this topic. And Kit forwarded me this article by Alice Rutkowski and suggested that I get in touch with her. And so I did. And then here we all are. So I was so excited Alice joined me for this podcast because she teaches and she studies American literature and also various other things. So we're talking about Louisa May Alcott, who's famously the writer of Little Women, but also she famously lived during the Civil War era of America, which is like not a time period I know super a lot about. So Alice was really able to help put everything in context about Louise's life and experiences, both in this kind of a queer reading of her life, but also just the American history of it all. So I was so grateful. Alice joined me for this conversation. I found it so fascinating and so interesting. So please enjoy this conversation with Alice Rutkowski about Louisa May Alcott. (laughs) 
I'm joined today by Alice Rutkowski. Welcome, Alice. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Could you please explain to everybody what your historical specialties are? So I'm a faculty member at SUNY Geneseo for uh, folks who, listeners who are not in the state of New York. I'm just, I I teach at a campus of the state, New York, the New York State uh, public college system. I'm an associate professor of English and the chair of the department. And I uh, specialize in 19th century American women writers, Civil War Reconstruction, And um, recently, um, because we may get to this in the podcast, um, also in the last 10 years, I've been working on uh, trans identity and trans politics, both in the 19th century and the 20th century. Well, and that really explains kind of how the paper that I found that you had written that made me want to invite you on the show, which is about Louisa May Alcott, American writer who was involved as a nurse in the Civil War, and the trans, a trans reading of her life, I guess. Can you explain how how you came to that topic? Absolutely. It is the case that I'm the first person to publish an academic article about this, but a a number of folks in kind of in popular culture in the last five years have been starting to move towards this interpretation of hers. So it's it's not an unusual take. I do quickly want to shout out another podcast that I hope um, if people are interested in this episode, they'll listen There's this wonderful podcast also by a Canadian writer and journalist, uh, Peyton Thomas, called Joe's Boys. And he's reading um, with guests. He's going through Little Women chapter by chapter and talking about queer and trans uh, readings of every chapter. So I'm not the only person to think this. But Alcott has a lot of themes in her work, both what we might call her children's literature And she wrote uh, a lot of what she called blood and thunder tales for adult sensation stories. She has a lot of themes in across all of her writing that has masquerade and acting and disguise that uh, previous scholars often read as feminist or as performance of gender. But with the new understandings in the last, say, 15, 20 years, we have vocabulary we have to talk about, trans identities different, more sort of expansive views of gender. Uh, So I I had those earlier readings when I was younger as well, a kind of second wave reading of Alcott as sort of a feminist that's angry about not having male privilege. But the the closer you read Alcott with these newer ideas and terms, newer to us that we have, the clearer it is to me that we're, we're talking at least about in my article, I call it trans feeling. I'm a cis lady. I'm not comfortable saying Alcott was trans, right? She did not have access to that vocabulary. But so, for example, the very first page of Little Women, which is probably her best known work that people are familiar with, Joe literally says, I cannot get over my disappointment in not being a boy. But, you know, that's pretty different than saying, I wish I had the freedom of a boy. And I do just want to clarify for the listeners, like the the same way that you do in your paper, like we're using she, her pronouns for Louisa May Alcott. Other people can make other decisions, but that's that's what we're doing. I'm so, I'm so I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yes, in the paper, I also say I've chosen to continue to use she, her pronouns. There's no indication that Alcott used other ones. Um, the idea of changing pronouns. Uh, I, I know you've you've had an episode or two that talked of, about other um, folks in the past who were trans. Um, it didn't seem to occur to Alcott that she could change her pronouns. Um, although she did um, in her life, she went by Lou in the way that uh, Josephine in Little Women goes by Joe. She did go by Lou, with it, which is a kind of masculinized version of her name. But I, I use she, her pronouns for her. No, exactly. And I think it's really um, just being led by how Louisa referred to herself. Yeah, in that way. Yeah. So before we get into like what we're going to talk about today is kind of Louisa May Alcott's life in general. And I'm glad you're here as an American person with a specialty in all these things, because I I know some stuff about American history, but not a lot. So you'll be able to contextualize a lot of things. But first, I just want to talk a bit about Little Women, because I think that's what that's what I certainly know her most from. You know, there was recently the the new movie about it. Like I grew up watching the Winona Ryder movie about it, obviously the book. So just things that are in the book, you know, Joe, Joe herself, the character starts off saying like, you know, I wish I was a boy and things. And then I'm more familiar. I've read the book, but I'm more familiar with the more recent movie just because that's what's in my head. And, you know, they have Saoirse Ronan is wearing like a man's jacket and a man's hat. Like there's a lot of 
tomboy-ish is how that can be described. Yep. Can you talk a bit about Joe's character in Little Women and just kind of gender? Greta Gerwig's movie is definitely plugged into these more, these newer kinds of readings of both Joe and Laurie, right? So in the novel, her best friend ostensibly is a boy. A lot of people are starting to see him as trans feminine in various different ways. The The history of the reception of Joe is really interesting. It's kind of the history of kind of feminist literary criticism of this period, by which I mean sort of early second wave feminism in the 70s. Oh, I should back up and say Alcott is really interesting in that for 19th century American women writers, a lot of scholars have to do something called recovery work, meaning they have to like find novels that no one's talked about in 150 years and then make a case for this person being important and needing to be read and also being good, right? There's ways in which women's writing from the 19th century is all often dismissed entirely. For Alcott, that's not true. She's never been out of print. And Little Women is the thing that kind of kept her there. Up until really the kind of 60s and 1960s and 70s, she's still seen as a, a children's writer, sort of by both by sort of fans of her work as well as um, academics studying her. Second wave feminism comes along and Joe is often read, right, as a kind of proto-feminist tomboy, but tomboy, there are all sorts of reasons that a girl, a, a girl might express herself in a tomboyish way, right? And some of those may have to do about discomfort in her own gender. Um, a lot of them have to do with wanting access to male privilege, but it's almost always framed as a phase, right? That's something that girls are allowed to do when they're girls, but they have to grow out of it when they become women. Um, and so initially she'll be read as a proto-feminist. Um, these early feminist critics also have a good deal of discomfort around the fact that Joe might not be straight, that Joe might not be a girl. A later set of uh, feminist readings are going to start to point out the way Alcott's whole novel, not just for Joe, but for the other three March sisters as well in the novel, right, who are modeled on Al Al Louisa May Alcott's own sisters and herself, that they're very much about the kind of strictures of femininity. And so even if the sisters aren't able to break out of this binary gender, it's, it's showing all the ways in which they're being disciplined into this gender. And then we get kind of 1990s on, we get queer theory and now kind of trans theory that's wanting to look even more expansively at that character. But the last thing I'll say, because uh, I want to make sure you get in more questions, is that Little Women is such a personal book for so many people. Like you can list dozens of important women writers that say this novel was their sort of formative. Um, Elena Ferrante has her two characters read this book together in the first, in the first novel in that series. So when you suggest other readings of Joe to people, it can be very upsetting. If you're a cis woman who found feminism through Joe it can be very unnerving to hear about these new interpretations that a uh, previous podcast I referred to, Peyton Thomas wrote a um, op-ed in the New York Times uh, this past January that, again, just made this very simple suggestion, right? Maybe Alcott was trans and he got a lot of blowback. So that's the thing. Two things I'll say about that. So firstly, I think it's beautiful that there's so much interpretation in this book and it could be part of it is people who love this book and grew up loving this book aren't used to literary criticism. So they feel like, how dare you? Where it's like, no, this is what scholars do about <laughs> every book. Like it's not saying that you're, so anyone's interpretation is not valid. It's just saying, well, what if it's this? And I think it's really lovely that so many people, because the character of Joe is very much just like, I want to do something amazing. I don't feel the same as other people. And that can be very validating to lots of different types of people, to like a cis straight girl who's just like, yeah, I also want more than what girls are allowed to, but also to a lesbian and also to a trans person, a non-binary person. Like it's all valid. It's not saying that other people's experiences are not true. We're just saying that like, what if this other thing? The other thing I wanted to mention what you just said about what happened with that article is my friend, the writer, Amanda Soleil, wrote a young adult novel recently. It's called Belittled Women. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's about, it's almost a parody of Little Women in a way. It's about four sisters who their job is they work as Little Women reenactors. 
and they're named after the characters from Little Women and their lives, you know, they kind of make fun of Little Women a bit, but actually their lives end up paralleling what happens in Little Women. And she got blowback from people who are like, how dare you make fun of Little Women? How dare you have a character named Joe who makes out with somebody? How dare you? Like, people are yeah. really, really attached to this book and they don't want it to be treated in any way other than just like crystallized in amber the way that they read it. Absolutely. And you're exactly right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm in no way interested in taking people's interpretations or the pleasure or the joy they have from the novel away from them. Right. All of those interpretations, you know, continue to have them. The only tricky thing with Alcott is me and some other people are also making the argument that it might also be Alcott, right? This is the tricky thing about little women is that so much of it is autobiographical, not all of it, but so people's attachment to Joe can can kind of bleed into their attachment to Alcott, right? Since Joe is sort of the Alcott figure, the the Louisa uh, figure in the novel, so it's it's not just literary interpretation; it's both. That's true, yeah. And I think that's also where, especially the two movie versions, really make that parallel very clear because both of the movies end with the character of Joe writing a book that is called Little Women. Like they really. So when I was thinking about and just talking to some of my friends who are American about Little Women and like what like its importance to kind of so many people, I think the fact that it's so close to in some ways to Louisa May Alcott's real life, that's where people feel like this is the story of Louisa. Joe is Louisa. So to challenge anything about like the any queer interpretation of the character becomes an interpretation of the writer and then. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, we, we might get into it if you want to talk about more about Little Women, um, but the it was written in, in two volumes, right? So the, the first volume is going to come out um, in 1868 and it's going to get such an extraordinary reception that she's prevailed on to write the second volume. But the second volume also is where things start to depart. I mean, again, not everything in the first volume is exactly her life either. But the second volume is going to start to depart more from uh, Lou's life and in particular, the the funny marriage that she makes for Joe in the second volume, um, Lou never got married, certainly not to a man, <laughs> um, but did, did not get married. And there's lots of arguments about what that move in the second volume made. There, there's passages in her journal where she talks about not necessarily, there might have been pressure from her publisher. There's not a, a kind of documentary evidence for that. But she definitely talks about pressure from fan mail from girls wanting to know who Joe was going to marry. And so it's possible she responded to that. It's sort of interesting to think about the form of the novel, too, right? That like for women writing novels about women, like what other kinds of endings are possible for women in the 19th century, right? Is it kind of narrative pressures? There was a great article from some second wave feminists that I think was written in the 1980s that suggested <laughs> that Alcott's kind of secretly kind of murdering Joe and replacing her with someone else, that the, the marriage simply doesn't make sense to who she is. And Gerwig's film handles that in a really kind of clever meta way. But that's something people really love to argue about because it's not it doesn't seem like something Alcott would have chosen if she had complete control about what to do in volume two. Well, and that's, I mean, we are in like a minute going to get into her biography and just her character and her personality and stuff. But I think my interpretation, just after having read a bit about Louisa May Alcott and her writings and what she was like, she was just kind of like, my readers are dumbasses. Like, <laughs> fuck yes. you. Like, you want Joe to get married? Yes. Fuck you. Here's who she's going to marry. Like, yeah. there's a vibe of that. Because her readers, her, re her readers kept writing her fan letters saying she has to marry Lori. And, and that says something that says a lot about Alcott, where she's like, absolutely not. Right. That is not what that relationship is about. And then she goes and marries Lori to Amy. Right. But um, I, I, I totally agree with that interpretation. I think she was like, OK, I'm going to marry her, but I'll make it really weird. Like, you want you want Joe to be married? Well, here's what's going to happen. I have a friend um, just again, who's like a big fan of, of Little Women and Anne of Green Gables and kind of like that classic sort of novel. And she's always been very disappointed that Lori and Joe didn't get married, and which is fine, which is valid. Lots of people feel that way. Extent that there was a book that came out, I think just this year or last year, that's a it's a published book, but it's like effectively sort of a what if fan fiction sort of thing. That's like, what if Joe and Lori did end up together? So it's kind of like that ending for people who want that. So it's, again, I think it's lovely 
that people have such strong feelings about the characters and what they should do. But I also think it's interesting that Louisa May Alcott was not just like, oh, this is what the fans want, so I'll make it happen. She's like, this is what the fans want. Fuck you, fans. Like, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. <laughs> like the fact that she, not just Joe doesn't marry lawyer, but the fact that Amy does, is just like, right. what is happening? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to go through Louisa May Alcott's life, um, but especially, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about Louisa's life, but also just like the queer aspect of it, of her. You know, a lot happened to her before Little Women was written, and I want to talk about that. Like, actually, first, can you talk just about, we have some of her diaries still can be read, right? Not all of them, but some of them. Yeah, um, there is, uh, there's a great, I'm forgetting it's over on my bookshelf. Um, there are some that have been published and there's a great edition of her kind of edited diaries. There are more available in the Harvard Library that they have more, so not all of them have been published. And I guess we'll get into this if you want to talk about her dad, Bronson. But from the earliest age, um, her and her sisters were all encouraged to keep um, journals um, to sort of talk about um, her, her her dad's kind of messed up in various different ways, but he was an education reformer and there's some good things about him. He believed in self-reflection. Um, he also like read their journals and like would like write, write on them in ways that were very intrusive, but it's, it's, it's a habit that she was encouraged to do sort of as a child, as part of her education. And it's something that she kept up with almost her whole life. Yeah. So a lot of the information we have about her and what she thought about things are coming from her or coming from her journal. So it's, you don't have to guess. Yeah. And there's also, there are some collected letters too. There's some, a, a decent number of letters available. So. Yeah. So my, the main source for this biography that I'm going to be reading is from the Women in World History, volume one, an article by Krista Martin. And what's interesting is this is a huge reference multi-volume set that they have at my local public library that I like to go to sometimes just to get. And I've never looked at, I always, I don't know, I'm always looking at like obscure women from random places. And there's always like, I'm excited if there's a page. For her, there was 11 pages. So yeah. <laughs> there's there's a, there's a lot known about her, which is for me for this show rare. So <laughs> what a treat. Um, okay, so she was born the second child of Bronson and Abigail May Alcott. Her mother was known as Abba. In Little Women, the mother is called Marmy. So, right. you know, mothers with unusual names. So can you, you just mentioned Bronson. So what's what's his deal? What? what? <laughs> well, the first thing I'll mention is that if we're talking about the differences between Little Women, the the set of novels and her life, in the first volume of Little Women, her dad is supposedly off at the Civil War being a chaplain. Her dad absolutely never went to the Civil War. She just needed basically to find a way to get rid of him because he was so difficult. He was a really interesting guy. So he's he's like best friends with um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is an important American writer, philosopher, poet, and Henry David Thoreau, who um, readers might know best as the author of uh, Walden where he decides that he's going to live entirely by himself in the woods by Walden Pond, this uh, little lake in Concord, Massachusetts, build his own house, only eat what he's grown himself. And in the book, a lot of ways, it has been an inspiration for the modern environmentalist movement. Like people will still absolutely quote Thoreau before things about sustainability. And then they also, the family is also friends with Nathaniel Hawthorne, who's the famous American novelist who wrote Scarlet Letter, amongst other things. And so Bronson is sort of part of this group of uh, men who are thinking these big thoughts and wanting to think broadly about what it means to be American and what it would mean to be kind of an American philosopher. He's the least kind of financially successful of all of these people. By all accounts, he was a really difficult person to get along with. He did have some really radical, useful ideas that are still with us. He, he was among a group of people who um, had really radical ideas around the education of children, which now we think of as um, very normal. So the idea, he believed children were born good and basically the best educational environment is just going to kind of put them in a supportive environment. Um, which now we think of as education, but that is absolutely not the way children were educated in the United States in the 19th century. They were thought of as kind of mini adults. Everything was rote memorization. 
And so he did have some pretty radical kind of romantic ideas about the education of children, which have sort of stayed with us. But he had trouble holding down a job. For him, it was sort of always about principles, like sort of the the, the gap between um, theory and praxis was really bad for sort of the people that depended on him economically. Um, Abba, who's Marmy in the in the books, was almost always having to figure something out in terms of making money, keeping her girls fed and clothed. So for him, principles were sort of more often more important than his family eating, which is difficult to read now. There are more generous readings of him that suggest he he might have suffered from various kinds of mental illness that now might be able to be treated. But he was a difficult he was a difficult person and he was not a great father. Yeah, he like this is sort of like if you're going to be a guy who like builds a house and lives in the woods and writes a book about it. Great. But if you're a guy with like four children and a wife to support, it's like maybe get a job and let people eat protein because yeah. he <laughs> right <laughs> yeah because they had this sort of like there was somebody else who did this i think it was percy shelley or lord byron one of them who were just like we're gonna be really um good people we're gonna only eat like n- bread like it was something about like we're gonna be vegetarians but to them it was just kind of like we're just gonna not eat anything with vitamins or sustenance to it and anyway do you know anything about the, I just, I came across this fact that he was just like, we're just going to eat a spiritual yeah. diet. Oh, here we go. Let me see. They subsisted on bread and vegetables because he believed a diet not dependent on the sacrifice of animals purified them spiritually. Yeah. And here's like, so some of this sounds really heady, although there are important political aspects to it. So for example, this, the group of folks with this belief also refused to wear cotton, but that was because it was raised by enslaved people in the South. Right. So it, it's it's both maybe seems ridiculous, but then there are kind of some political principles in here. So uh, Bronson and then actually a, a couple um, English dudes that he met, they made an attempt at a utopian sort of commune, which a number of people did in the 19th century. It's interesting. Um, Thoreau actually didn't want to be a con- on a commune. He just wanted to be by himself. But they made this attempt, which was uh, Bronson and a, and a, uh, these sort of English thinkers and philosophers um, who were also men. And they brought along Abba and the girls. And um, they, the, the men spent most of their time sort of sitting under trees and talking about big ideas. And Abba ended up doing all of the work. Um, if people are interested in a um, hilarious uh, satire of this, Al- Louisa May Alcott wrote a short story called Transcendental <laughs> Wild Oats that I would recommend Um, to anyone. And you could probably even just find it by Googling it, but it's hilarious in the way that it skewers these sort of uh, male big thinkers um, and and sort of leaving the work for girls and women instead of doing their part, right? They wanted a a self-sustaining farm, but they weren't willing to farm. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Wasn't there something (laughs) about Thoreau where like his mother was doing his laundry and cooking for him or something when he was claiming to be self-sufficient? Yeah, like his, historians have definitely found that he was getting, quote unquote, more help. So it's the kind of thing where like, because uh, he was very, very close with Emerson. And so, you know, he'd go to Emerson's house and be like, hey, can I borrow an axe? Or people would invite him over to dinner or Emerson would bring by food. So it's not entirely, I mean, it's tricky, right? I think it's not sort of a binary where he's like either a slacker or a perfect person. I mean, his, ex- his experiment in some, in a lot of ways were, were still really interesting. This is my students always get. He also wrote, um, what's the name of the, the essay? Um, where basically he goes to jail for his beliefs. He's against the, the war in Mexico. And he writes this essay from jail. And my students are always like, oh, but, but Emerson bailed him out. He was only there for one night. And I like to say, well, but have you ever been to jail for your beliefs, right? It can be both and, right? He can have privilege, but also have done a kind of scary, radical thing. Like both are true at the same time. Yeah, yeah. It just, I, I'm just like, just my my lens of just like these guys sitting under the tree while Abba has to do everything. It's just like, get it together, you guys. So um, <laughs> eventually they went, wind up in Concord, Massachusetts. Why did they move there? Do you know? So that's where all the famous folks live. So I think um, at very they move sort of in and out of Concord, but at various points, um, Emerson is kind of helping them out or they move into Hawthorne's old house. 
and the the historical Alcott House, Orchard House, is still there if people want to go and visit the historic site. But so basically, it's some of their famous friends are able to help them out. And so while she was living there, Louisa, or Lou as a child, was described as rambunctious, full of energy. Bronson thought that this was unfeminine and um, improper, but she liked to be able to run around. She liked being in nature. And this is where she met Henry David Thoreau, who this essay claims was her lifelong unvoiced love. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we can't like, you can't prove the absence of things like that. That strikes me as ter- completely untrue. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just like, yeah, she- yeah I mean, she, she, she's <laughs> open that she prefers like, again. So it's, it's not sort of openly, she doesn't talk about romances with women um, but she talks openly about kind of preferring girls over boys in terms of desiring them. Also, re- recent scholars of Thoreau think that he he might have been gay or at least um, sort of gay and ace. And it makes perfect sense that she would have found him so appealing because that's the kind of boy or man she she wanted to be, right? Thoreau is is sort of a model of independence and self-sufficiency. So... They, they absolutely, they had a relationship where they like go pick berries together and stuff. But this idea that she always longed for him romantically strikes me as wrong. Yeah. What you just said is very interesting. Like the fact that this essay was like, yeah, we're pretty sure she was secretly in love with him and never wrote about it. But we think this is in her heart. It's like, what? Okay. <laughs> Clearly they had this relationship. She was inspired by him. And she also liked being alone. She liked being in nature. Like we see that. We also see that some like... It's unavoidable. Like Joe, like just as a character was just kind of like, oh, you're not feminine enough. You know, people were sort of seeing that in her as well. Well, and sort of, I was just going to jump in and also say like that description from the encyclopedia about her being, I'm forgetting like rambunctious. I don't know, it was disobedient, but like, again, some of this seems to suggest some evidence. Again, I don't want to say what Lou Alcott was, but, but this idea that she's chafing against these expectations, not only of femininity, right? Which most of us women now who um, are firmly identified as cis women would have chafed against as well in the 19th century, right? It was awful. Mm -hmm. I I think it goes further for her, right? It's not just, oh, I don't want to be this kind of woman, but um, she's being put in this box that's so restrictive, right? Even more restrictive than like her sisters who seemed comfortable as women, but didn't like the like limitations that patriarchy put on them. And we're going to talk about her story with the Italian siblings, but that's that's coming okay. later. Because that makes me think about that. Okay, anyway, but so, like, in her writing, like, just these are some quotes from her journal. Like, she, like, her father, especially, and presumably her mother, and, like, society was just being like, don't act this way. Try and be a better person. And she tried, right? She says, people think I'm wild and queer, but mother understands and helps me. Now I'm going to work, really, for I feel a true desire to improve and be a help and comfort, not a care and sorrow to my dear mother. So... Yeah, she, she wanted to like quote improve herself. She wanted to be the sort of daughter that they wanted her to be, but that's just not who she was, and that's the struggle that people relate to, that queer people relate to, the trans people relate to, cis people relate to. It's just like, yeah, if if who you are is at odds with who your parents want, then that's hard. That's rough. Then this says for the next several years, as she bent to the task of remolding herself, her journals were blank. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I, I like your reading of that a lot, right. That it doesn't, uh, that I think that's because a lot of that does end up in the way that Joe thinks about herself in the novel. It often in the first volume is like all of the girls. And in some ways, little women is fairly conventional. It's got some really, um, kind of subversive stuff. Some of it's hidden and some of it's not but all the girls are sort of working to be better people, like to become little women. Right. And that's Mm -hmm. the thing that for contemporary, I think readers sometimes is a, a, it seems like she's compromising or can't say what she thinks or something. But for Joe, the things she's often work working to like get better about is her temper. And certainly the idea that women and girls aren't supposed to be angry. Right. I mean, you, you need to treat people well, right. I'm not saying you should randomly shout at people, but the idea that that's not an emotion, right. That anger, right. Or annoyance is not an emotion that um, women should have because it's unladylike. So that, that struggle in the novel, I think speaks to what you're talking about, right. These sort of feelings about being 
trapped and it comes out as anger and annoyance. Well, and that just reminds me too about another character from this era of fiction that a lot of people grow up really feeling a kinship to, which is Anne Shirley from Anne of Green Gables, right? Who's also a little girl with a temper. Like little girls, I think, see these characters who are just like have so much feeling and it just spills over. And you relate to that. Little boys, like little anybody can see these characters and just be like, I'm like that too, you know? Like there's something so relatable about that. Yeah, you know, and I mean, what, to, state, to state the obvious, like those like assumptions about the way gender should work in terms of emotions are still with us. The sort of like boys will be boys stuff, right? Where like a child is misbehaving and treating another child poorly, right? Which is what, you know, children don't know the rules yet, right? But the idea is you step in and you explain what the right thing is to do. And still for boys, they're often not parented in ways that remind them that they need to be thinking about others. Um, and we probably go too far on the other way with girls, where girls have to, even now, right, have to constantly be thinking about others. Other, How are people looking at you? How are you affecting them? How can you, you know, take responsibility for other people's feelings? All of this really dangerous stuff. Well, and then that also lends to, and you get to this in your essay as well, Joe voices that she wishes she was a boy. And it's like, that could mean so many things. But one of the things it could mean is just like, I want to be able to be mad sometimes. It doesn't necessarily mean like I'm uncomfortable in my physiology. It could just mean like, I want to get to be like what the boys are like, which is also, which is, which it could be both. It could be both. It could be like, I'm uncomfortable with my physiology. And I want to be able to express anger sometimes. Like it doesn't necessarily mean dysphoria. Absolutely. And that, that actually brings me back because you asked an earlier question about uh, tomboyism, because this is often the way um, the, the, the biggest descriptor that both popularly and scholarly write Joe as a tomboy. But I guess the, the reminder for me is that tomboy is a description of an expression of gender. It's not like a, it's not necessarily a gender itself. So as you said, um, girls and women might seek out that expression of gender for all kinds of reasons. Um, it might be that they, oh, actually, I'm a boy. And it might be, um, I'm going to settle into conventional femininity because that feels right for me. Or it might mean, right, um, they'll end up as a kind of masculine woman. Um, but this idea that that says something fundamental about the person, again, there's there's too many interpretations, right? There's too many yeah. ways. What matters is the intention of the person, of the, yeah. the person um, expressing their gender in that way. Well, we see in Louisa, just in the sense of like these this time period where she just was trying to improve herself. It's like, this was something she herself struggled with. She wanted to try and be a different different kind of person, a more socially acceptable woman than what her personality was. I wanted to mention this because I found this interesting. You mentioned like the forward thinkingness, like Bronson, I feel like deadbeat dad, piece of shit. But there was like, (laughs) there's there's good things in his family and there's good things in his philosophy. Um, So... There's a part where um, Abba, so Louisa, she has a sister named Anna, who's kind of the Meg character. And so the two of them help Abba teach a group of black children to read because the city provided no schools for blacks, is how this phrase is. Sorry, I don't don't mean to use the word blacks. Um, (laughs) This is an old essay. But so like, and they were involved in the abolition movement, right? Like the family was very, very progressive for like a white family in America in this time period. Yeah. And, and there's a later, I think, again, I I don't have the whole sequence of all of Bronson's various failed schools, but there's a later school, I think in the Massachusetts area, maybe it's in Concord or Boston that he opens that's meant to be progressive and it's serving mostly, um, you know, what sort of well-off like um, white families uh, with progressive politics, and they decide to admit one black student to that school, a free black person, and the school's shut down. So again, this is tricky, right? This goes back to to Bronson's kind of like theory and practice thing. Like that is the right thing to do, right? But it also means he can't support his family anymore. Like yeah. so, to suggest there's some easy answer, but again, they they helped. They helped Black fugitives who had escaped from enslavement. Again, I think often now, at least in American history, it seems really easy to be like, oh, of course, that was the right thing to do. This was still a pretty radical and dangerous position to take. Like they were part of the the Underground Railroad, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's weird to say something like they were a stop on the Underground Railroad, but they were they were they were ready to help fugitives, right? Because yeah. it, it was sort of like this sort of loose network of people who were ready to help when they could. And this was a pretty 
dangerous thing to do um, in the 1850s after the, um, in 1850, this law gets passed in the United States called the Fugitive Slave Law, whereas before um, this law, white people in the North could just kind of, they could be against slavery, but they didn't really have to think about it all that much. Like it didn't really affect them if they didn't want it to affect them. The law in 1850 requires basically law enforcement and judges in the North to help catch escaped people, fugitive people. And any person found helping them ends up with big fines and jail time. So this is one of the things that gets us heading towards the Civil War, whereas, again, white people, if they didn't want to think about it before, they could kind of be anti-slavery. But like, I don't know, like someone posting something on their Facebook page, but not actually doing anything. People then sort of have to make it a decision because it basically nationalizes slavery, even in places where slavery is not legal. So slavery is not legal in Massachusetts, but everyone is forced to help catch um, fugitive enslaved people and send them back to slavery. So that's really, I don't want to discount how major that was and how, I keep using the word progressive, but it's just like this family was doing things in this era in the 1850s that people now in 2023 would be like, Ugh, I'd rather just post a black square on my Instagram. <laughs> You exactly. know, like they were stepping yeah. up in a real way. And so I respect that. But that's also what's interesting because to be progressive and I'm saying the family, I mean, like Bronson is the head of the family, very much the family was following his direction. Abba was also had strong principles, clearly, but that they were so progressive in those ways. But at the same time, they're like, oh, but Louisa, could you have a more traditional feminine expression? It's interesting. It's an interesting dichotomy that they're like, they're cool in one way, but in the other way, they're just like, could you stop having a like temper? Thank you. Like, it's interesting. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And it's a reminder, right, that um, these kind of intersections don't move kind of in tandem in the way that we would want them. Like there were various anti-slavery societies in the United States that um, had separate organizations for men and women, right? So these are people committed to radical politics, right, to freeing people from enslavement. But the idea that, that they might let women be in leadership roles was a huge issue, um, yeah. So the idea, yeah. And then the reminder that being anti-slavery doesn't mean you're anti-racist. There were plenty of people that like didn't think black people should be enslaved, but also didn't think they should be equal. So. So I like this turn of events, which is, so Louisa was always writing in her journal. She was writing, I think she and her sisters were all writing plays that they would act out, which we also see in Little Women, where they have that scene. Is it, I presume it's in the book because it's in both of the movies. Again, I have read the book, but the movie's just imprinted more strongly on me, where they all dress up as men that are all like, here, here, here's my new play. And they all have like fake pipes and beards and hats. So like gender is like, you know, there, there's some gender stuff in that story. Anyway, so she was always writing. And then she, um, 1851, she has her first poem published under the name Flora Fairfield. Three years later, another piece, a story by Flora Fairfield comes out. She's paid $10. And then her first novel, Flower Fables, was published. And here's, I appreciate this about Louisa May Alcott. So she's 22 years old and she's just like, wait, if I write stuff, I can make money and then we don't have to worry about my deadbeat dad anymore and I can be the family breadwinner. And so, and the family was like, yeah, actually great. So she didn't have to teach as much and she um, just started writing and she was writing as, she clearly liked writing. I don't want to say she didn't like writing, but she saw it as a career. And so she saw it as like, if I write this sort of thing, it will be published. Therefore, I will write this sort of thing. And that's kind of how her career progressed. Like she was very, not mercenary, practical. She's very practical. I would say like, and savvy and savvy too, I think. Because I think, yeah, because I read when I, I I read in advance the the little bio you had you were going to use, and it's interesting. I do think there's this little. In some ways, I think this is its own kind of sexism. This idea that like writing for money can't produce great art, right? Which is absolutely not the case. Um, there are a lot of uh, famous men writers from the 19th century, like who who had family money in various ways, right? So maybe they didn't have to. Um, I mean, Hawthorne's someone that's a little bit like that, but the fact that she was really savvy and could write in lots of different genres and like saw what her market wanted to me, that makes it seem that she's really versatile and savvy rather than like, Oh, she has to write for money. Yeah. Oh, she's a sellout or whatever. Yeah. You think about someone yes, like, I exactly. Don't, I don't know a lot about this, but I believe I've read that Charles Dickens was paid per word or something. So he's like, oh, I'm going to write the longest novels you're ever going to see. Like, and no one's like, Charles Dickens, he was writing for money. You know, it's, you're right. I think it's a gender thing. 
That's a great comparison. Yeah. And she was a huge Dickens fan. Like there's tons of stuff in Little Women where she's like borrowed character names and stuff like that. So that's a great comparison. Yeah. So she realizes that she can make money from writing. And you know what? Good for her. Like she has this skill and she's able to do it. And she sees like, oh, when I write like this, I get paid. And then like, we don't have to worry about my Debbie dad. She grew more confident in her 20s. This essay says her rising status as a family breadwinner gave Louisa immeasurable pleasure. So I like, I don't know. It's not just like, oh, she's doing this for money. It's like she's doing this for money because her family needs money because they've been like eating potatoes for 10 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like when you hear about actors who, you know, work their way up and they get some breakout role. They're like, I was so I was able to buy my mother a house like so often. That's what people do. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And I, I like, I mean, in that part, the part about her getting pleasure, I agree with, right? She was someone who like, you can sort of see in her journals, she doesn't love all her literary pow- output equally, but sometimes she'll even say like, well, I don't think that story is that great, but I got to practice X, Y, and Z. Like she's someone who's like seeing, oh, I got, you know, I got better at plot or I got better at characterization or something like she's, you know, um, she's a, she's a working writer, which like in any decade is admirable, right? Most writers don't make enough to live. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not so secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going. If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash realm. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. Look for The Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live or at ghoststoryguys.com. And we're back. No, this is like like goals to a lot of people, what she's able to do. And she was supporting her family. And so it what this how this phrases it is she outgrew her position in the family as like the troublesome one. And her earnings from the writings made her the glue that kept the Elcots together. Like she really revitalized and kind of saved her family. And so it's like, oh, she used to be the like black sheep of the family, but now it's like she's the one who's like, thank God for Louisa, which is an interesting and delightful turn after 
she, the way that she felt for so long, you know, that she was, there's something wrong with her. And now she's the one who saves the day. I do like, I would do want to note because we've been talking in recent episodes, I've been doing these Mary Queen of Scots episodes and I've been talking about the importance of sewing and embroidery. She took in sewing to supplement her writing income. Good for her. You know, again, it's like, <laughs> there's a skill that you have that people will pay you for. Cash in on it. Okay, so um, then this is again, when the story gets similar to Little Women, I'm like, oh, I see where she got that from. So, so her youngest sisters fell ill with scarlet fever, which they caught from a charitable visit to a nearby family which is what happens to Beth in Little Women. Yeah. Yes. In 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 Little in Little Women, the first volume, she has Beth get better and then like uh, kills her off in volume two. So it's you know, so the t- the timeline's a little bit different than in her life, but Beth's fate is ultimately the same. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting. Actually, I do want to mention this was a conversation I had like years ago. I wrote an article about it, but. There, there are some people, so because Little Women was published in two parts, there is, and it's never been out of print. There are some editions of Little Women that are just the first part, and it ends, Beth is sick, and then she gets better. So there's people right. there who are like, I love Little Women, I read it, but the version they read, Beth doesn't die. That happened to, that happened to me in high school, because I, I had an edition that I read over and over and over, and when I got to high school, someone re- mentioned Beth's death, and I was like... Just no, she gets, herself. No, she, she gets better. <laughs> she gets better. Like, no. So it's, it's interesting the way that it was published, but so Louise, well, do you know, this is a little, this is a little bit off. Do you know that episode of friends? Yeah. There's this episode of friends. Yeah. Where Joey and Rachel decide to f- read each other's favorite books. And so she reads the shining and he reads little women. And it's actually very sweet for all the sort of retrograde things now that friends doesn't hold up. But like, Joey's like, is she going to get better? Is she going to get better? And Rachel's like, no. <laughs> Well, and Louisa Mayalka, I mentioned she had the older sister, Anna. She has one of her younger sisters is called May, which is just Amy, but the letters moved. And she literally has a sister called Beth, who... She's died. the only name, the sister whose name she doesn't change, yeah. Yeah, and Beth, real, real Beth, dies of yes. scarlet fever. So Louisa had nursed her diligently, slept at her bedside. Like, she was very, 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 very close to her sisters in a way that the sisters are very close in Little Women as well. So her older sister, Anna, who's like the Meg character, announces that she's going to marry somebody. And then like in Little Women, uh, Louisa gets upset like that her family, like she it's like we were the sisters. And now it's like Beth dies, like the oldest sister is leaving to get married. No, she's like, no, I like this life that we had. And this is where I think she's like, I wish I could marry. Is this in the book or is this in her life? It's in the book. She says, I wish I could marry Meg myself and keep her safe in the family. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like that's similar to how Louisa Mayalka was feeling. She just wanted them to all be together. And then um, the fall of 1859, she had her greatest publishing success to date when her story, one of her stories was accepted by the Atlantic Monthly, which earned her $50, which I'm sure conversion rate is spectacular. Anyway, and so she's just like, she's, she's killing it. She's killing it. She's writing these stories. They're being put in these like very prestigious publications. And then her sister, her younger sister, May, slash Amy, also leaves the home to go to study and teach painting, much like Amy in Little Women. So the Civil War, what year does the Civil War start? Uh, 1861. Yeah. So 1860. So this is like 1860. Like she's, she's killing the game, like writing these stories. And then the Civil War starts. And so she's like, I want to be a soldier slash a man is what she says, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and she she wishes that she could enlist as a soldier. There are some memoirs and some, I, I mean, this has happened in every war ever where women disguise themselves as men to fight in the war. Alcott was not one of those. There are a number of memoirs from American women who did do that. But what she does do is she signs up to be a nurse in Washington, D.C., uh, which is a uh, uh, if you think about the geography of America, it's very actually sort of strange that the Washington, D.C. was and is the capital of our nation. Um, but Richmond, which is not that far in Virginia, is not that far from Washington, D.C., was the capital of the Confederacy. So like Washington, D.C. sits sits right on top of Virginia. And so Washington, D.C. is basically kind of on the front lines in a lot of ways. And so there are a lot of hospitals there. That's where they'll when they can evacuate the boys and men who have been wounded, they often will bring them there. The sort of Women as nurses was was not entirely a thing yet in terms of being a, a profession. Women and girls, of course, did all of the work in the home of nursing people. 
but it was considered improper, especially for unmarried women to be nurses to men they did not know, right? Because they would have to like see them naked and wash them and stuff like that. That was very, very scandalous. The Civil War is basically going to invent the profession of nursing for women in the United States in, in various different ways. And so this is this opportunity that Lou suddenly has to join the war effort in some sort of way. What it says here is that they called out, they wanted middle-aged women to serve as nurses. And she was just like, mm, I'm just going to go anyway. Cause she's like, I don't know, 25. Yeah. Although 25 is already a spinster true, true. <laughs> in, in the 19th century, but you're absolutely right. Um, they really only wanted kind of middle-aged married women, but they were starting to make exceptions because like every war, both sides were like, oh, this will last a couple of weeks and then it'll be over. And that's like not what happened. Yeah. So she does get this placement in this Washington hospital. Um, she comes down with typhoid and has to leave after six weeks, which um, made her ill for the rest of her life in various different ways. Um, but it also then led to her, she wrote an account of that called Hospital Sketches that started as kind of letters home. And then she kind of compiled them, published them in a magazine, and then it became a book. And that was like her first big, um, really big literary success. And um, that's something else that I would, it's pretty short that I would recommend to people if you're a newbie to Louisa May Alcott. The authorly voice is just so hilarious and modern. Um, I always tell my students, I mean, I guess not Twitter now, but Twitter a couple years ago, I feel like Alcott would have killed it on Twitter. Like she's yeah. hilarious and has this really snarky um, authorial voice that I really enjoy. Well, so you mentioned that she got typhus and then what this is, and again, this is like an older-ish essay I was looking at, but it was saying that she was treated with mercury and it was the mercury poisoning was part of what led to her lifelong illness from then. Yeah, it caused health problems for the rest of her life in various kinds of, I guess, I don't know, it's early arthritis, but it would cause pain throughout her body. She actually taught herself later in life to write with her left hand so that when her right hand became exhausted and strained, um, partially in response to this kind of chronic health condition she has, she could write with her left hand. Which is like killing it. Like she's just like, <laughs> let's go. I'm going to write. This is what I do. And then around this point of time, she finds that her more literary writing didn't make as much money as the like passionate and racy stories. So this is where she starts. She wrote something called Pauline's Passion and Punishment, for which she earned her largest payment, $100. But knowing that these sorts of stories were like racy or whatever. So she published these, on, or maybe you can tell me why, but she published these stories under the name A.M. Bernard. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I'll say is she actually was writing all of these genres simultaneously. So it is like she, she, uh, she you know, she'll sort of have a journal entry where she's like, oh, I just got something accepted at the Atlantic Monthly or Harper's, which are these very kind of highbrow literary magazines. And in the same breath, she'll be like, oh, I just submitted this story to Frank Leslie's, which is this kind of like trashier. But so she's actually kind of writing everything all at the same time. I mean, eventually she'll make so much money with Little Women that she seems to have kind of given up the sensational stories. But she's sort of writing everything all at the same time. Um, so she she wins. She wins. The, I, th I think it was Frank Leslie's. She wins a kind of contest where she submits a story and it gets accepted and makes a bunch of money. And she, she starts writing a bunch of those as well. And so some of them are published anonymously. Some are published under this pseudonym, Anne Bernard. And so uh, the thought is, right, that she, you know, she doesn't want her name or her family's name associated with this other, with these other kinds of genres. And that also did make it harder for kind of scholars to find later on. Although she talks very openly in her journal, right? She'll be like, I got paid for this. And then I got paid for this. It's like, it's not super hard to follow the dots. Yeah, because the, the sensational stories, like those were, it was like in the 20th century, like the mid, late 20th century is when I think scholars found most of them and put them together. Yes. So yeah, so she's just like, again, killing it. She's writing all this stuff. And then she goes to Europe with her sister and she didn't like it there, I believe, right? Well, so she goes, yeah, she goes as like, a, so it's like a, a rich family that has, I think, an invalid daughter who's also named um, Anna. And she goes as a kind of companion for that person. There were some things she liked about it, but it, it's not the kind of job. She's not like traveling on her own dime, right? So it's not the kind of thing where she can sort of say, oh, I'm going to go off to that museum or I'm going to go off to that restaurant. So some of that trip she enjoyed and some was really challenging. 
And there's something about this is not in the essay I'm writing, but I just remember there's a there's a historical fiction novel that imagines her time in Europe because she fell in love with a man, maybe. And then she burned all of her diary entries from that time or something like that. Yeah. And this is one of those like maybe she fell in love with him. So there were a couple like. Um, so when she was younger, saying that she was friends with boys is not strange, right? People are friends with people of the same age. She had a long correspondence with someone more her age where she kind of got to talk about guy stuff with, like the letters to to that person are are very much about like their shared boyish interests. And so she does meet this young Polish guy. So the only thing that, you know, is so he, I think he, at this point, he's significantly younger than her. I'm forgetting the age difference. So I, I don't know, you know, no one knows for sure whether it was romantic. Um, again, in, in terms of the way she felt about boys, it often seemed a lot more about identification than desire and her own longing to have that kind of freedom and gender presentation. So uh, I'm that that's the reading I'm convinced of. But you're right that um, no one knows for sure. So she she went to Europe. Things happened. Those diaries don't tell us exactly what happened. Um, And then (laughs) this is the most terrible sentence. Again, I appreciate this long encyclopedia. I'll just read you what it says. For Alcott, the next 20 years were predictable, lifeless, and sad. Yeah, I know. I saw that entry too. I mean, I think it's true that there were a lot of things that were difficult. She spent the rest of her life kind of caring for aging parents. Right. And, and that can, I do think that that can take its toll, but also like she got pretty wealthy from little women. She had like tons of fans. She was able to provide for her family and even like for the things she wanted much more easily. Um, I mean, you probably saw like her dad finally dies and she dies a couple days later. So it, it is the case that I don't think she was fulfilled in the way that we would want her to be reading how amazing she is. But I think that's a little bit of an overstatement. She had lots yeah. of friends. Um, she you know, adopted her sister's kid. She actually adopted, uh, so May's, May dies after childbirth and she adopts her baby. But she also adopts um, Anna's boys when they're adults um, just to make sure they get her money. And they changed their last name to Elcott. And they changed their last name to Alcott. Yeah, this is one of the things I like to say is that like, you know, this idea, like she's thinking about privilege and patrilineality, right? Like the the people that change their names are women when they get married. And so her insistence on that change was interesting to me too. And she said, I want to be a father. I want to be a father to Anna's boys. Yeah, a father. Like this is like the gender stuff is just, it's really like, oh, what's the word? fluid. It's very, it's very fluid, like her use of, of gendered words. But so we're getting up to the point where she writes Little Women. But before she writes Little Women, I believe she writes the story that you wrote your whole essay about enigmas. Can you talk yes. about enigmas? Well, first of all, yeah, just talk about like what name she published it under, why it's not discussed very much and what it's about. Okay, so this was one of the stories that she wrote for Frank Leslie's, uh, which when I say it's kind of a trashier newspaper, I don't know that we have an equivalent to this right now, but it would have a variety of things. It would it would have news, right? So there'd be like reports from the front, from the Civil War. It might have poems. It, it would have advertisements. It might have some fiction. Um, it's definitely more of a mass appeal than something like The Atlantic or um, Harper's, which were sort of highbrow publications. That's what I'm going to say. Like, it's like your short story. It's not in The New Yorker. It's like it's in Playboy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's I, I was trying to think of an equivalent. Exactly. And so and so in some ways, the story is like lots of her other stories. There are like sort of spies and escapes and secrets and disguises. So it's not totally unusual. The the thing that makes it a little bit different, it's, it is published under her own name, although it says L.M. Alcott. And then the other thing is it gets so the the second wave feminists, actually, there's a book dealer who discovers almost all the supposedly hidden pseudonymous stories in the 70s. It's almost entirely escaped both critical edition and then getting into almost any of the anthologies of her sensation stories. I have my own theory about why that's the case. I think the fact that it wasn't hidden made it less interesting, right, for the people who were doing the sleuthing. But then to to my mind, it's also kind of the most openly um, trans-themed of her stories, which has made a lot of people uncomfortable. Really briefly, 
the story has a first person male narrator who is um, employed to go spy on this kind of country house. It's set in Europe, uh, seemingly in England. And he looks at these strange inhabitants of this house. One of them is the this kind of like patriarch or lord of the manor or something, whose name is Bernard Noel, which already echoes Alcott's pen name, who appears to be a man in all these various different ways. And at the end, supposedly, it's quote unquote revealed that all along this was a girl who'd been disguised as a man and Clyde thinks they're in love with them. But uh, a closer reading of the story really suggests that this character seems to be a a trans man instead of someone in disguise. There are all these clues about um, the the way that this identity is sort of really sort of felt within themselves and not just kind of a ploy to trick people who are trying to find him out. Well, and I, not having read the the story itself, but having read your description of the story in your essay, I like the fact that, so there's Bernard, who is this trans figure, and then Bernard's sister, Clarice. And so you talk in your essay about how, um, you know, they're both in disguise for various reasons, quote unquote disguise. But Clarice is so bad at being in disguise. Like she can't be anything other than who she is. It's like (laughs) she can't pull it off. She just can't be a person in disguise. And that's what reminded me when we were talking earlier about Louise May Alcott trying to be a a good girl. It's just like, I can't not be me. (laughs) This is me. Like, I can't pull this off. That journey, the journey of this disguise in in the story, supposedly Bernard, who was born, Monica, D- describes like, oh, when I was a little boy, I had to be in this disguise as a boy to be safe, but I discovered I really loved it. The kind of um, the kind of narrative of coming to understand himself I, feels very contemporary to me in the way that this isn't the case for all trans people, but in the way that for some trans people dressing up in a way that's temporary, like Halloween or for a play or something like that, helps them realize, oh, I actually, this was a safe way to try something out. And, oh, I, now I realize like, this is not just clothes, right? I feel much more comfortable this way, but I think this story feels really, um, modern and in the, in the kind of description of the psychology of coming to understand who you are. Which is so interesting because Louisa May Alcott also wrote plays, wanted to be an actor for a while. So there is this, there's that level of exactly what you're just saying. So like, if you're somebody who is like wearing costumes and disguises for a while, like that's a way to try on different identities. You can be like, you know what, this one kind of fits me. I kind of like this one. Yeah. And then as you pointed out, like with the sister, for some people, they're like, oh, that was fun. Well, I mean, she's not technically in a play, right? But like, she doesn't want to go around the whole story dressed as this like older blind French lady, right? She's just not into it because that's not who she is. And so for some actors, they're like, oh, that was fun, but I want to go back to being me. But sort of acting as costumes as as a way to be like, oh, like this expression fits me a lot better. And it's kind of a safe way to do it. So this story, Enigmas, came out pre-Little Women, I think, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's just, it's interesting. It's interesting because, I mean, you're obviously very familiar with the oeuvre of Louisa May Alcott, but just these themes of like gender and performance, uh, like it seems like that's a real through line in her work to the point that it's like, well, that's clearly something that she's thinking about herself, presumably. Absolutely. And I mean, that's the, like, I would encourage folks who've read Little Women and are interested in these kind of readings. If you just open your mind to sign of trans possibilities and you reread Little Women, it's not even subtext. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. This idea that it's, again, I'm thinking about the react reactionary, like, oh, it's not there. It's not in the text, but doesn't Joe, like almost every other page, be like, I wish I was a boy? Like, is it right? Yeah. And, and this is where, again, like th- this does, everyone can still continue to have the things they love about the text. But that's the one of the things I argue in my article is like, we need to listen. This is the sort of like, you know, when, I don't know, maybe a friend of yours comes out to you as trans now. Um, we just, we need to listen to people when they say like, this is who I am. And like Joe repeatedly, again, not subtext says over and over again in the novel. And that's, and, and looking also at, um, Laurie's longing for femininity, um, is, is sort of another interesting thing to do when you're rereading the novel. And it's just interesting too. And I just remember this from one of the interviews when the recent movie came out, Greta Gerwig is talking about like the fact that Joe and Laurie, they're both names that are of the not of their gender that they're presenting as. So both like the, the exactly. characters themselves, and she was saying like how in that movie, how the two of them trade clothes pieces back and forth. Like she was just saw like Joe and Lori as both kind of being like, yeah, just gender 
not technically gender fluid, but just kind of like there's something there. There's something going on with the gender there. Yeah. And also the fact that they find each other, right? This idea of sort of chosen family. I mean, you know, um, Joe adores her sister and her mother's, right? Lou adored her sister and her mother. So this isn't to say um, she's not getting love and support from them for who she is. But the fact that she and Lori in the novel find each other, there's, and, and Lori's interesting. There's not just one analog for Lori in the way that the sisters like map directly onto Lou's sisters. And Lori is more of a, maybe a composite of other people. But I also feel like it's a little bit kind of, you know, wish fulfillment for Lou, right? That you could find this other person that that has sort of similar feelings, although they sort of go the opposite way, right? Someone born a boy who seems to long for femininity. And their relationship is one of the best things about the novel. And I, you know, again, I don't think it's romantic. I think I think it's absolutely full of love in the way that um, people find friends whom they love and are as important to them as blood family. So it's, this is also interesting. She wrote Little Women because, okay, she was approached about like, hey, could you write a children's story? And she's like, I'm on it. Like, I can write any genre. I will do this. But it was something like this guy said he would publish her dad's book if she would also write a children's book. So it's kind of like she's like, okay, I'll do this so that my father can publish was part of it. I know. And that's such a perfect encapsulation of their tricky relationship, right? He's the dad, supposedly the philosopher, the provider, And she's kind of cutting this deal to get his book published. And so like you were saying before, like there's nothing wrong or bad about writing or doing anything, any sort of work for money. But also her diaries are like, I'm sure every writer at some point when writing is just like, God damn it, why am I doing this? I hate this book. It's a terrible book. So like she wrote in her diary, she says something like, "Um, I plot away, though I don't enjoy this sort of thing which doesn't necessarily mean that she disavows the book. It just means she was, she's just like, okay, I guess I'll write this. And then people loved it. Um, Like it became so successful, as you said, that there was a demand to write a sequel. And so like as the savvy business person she was, she wrote the sequel. And this kind of made her career financially, right? Like this book just took off in this wild way that she was like, okay, great. I don't need to like write a short story every month anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, you know, and when her parents are older and she's taking care of them, like fans will, it's the kind of thing where like fangirls will show up at the door and knock on the door. Like yeah. the the, it, the novel, it, it was huge. It never stopped being huge. It's been a bestseller ever since it was published. Yeah. And then so she wrote some other like, quote, children's books, which is interesting. Can I just say? So Little Women is a book about most of it. It's about adult people. So to consider it a children's book is interesting to be like, to put this on the shelf next to a book that's about like, oh, I just lost my first tooth or whatever. It's like, well, this is not how we see children's books now. But then it was. Anyway, so she was this children's writer. She wrote other kind of books. What was, the, it's like Eight Cousins and um, Joe's Boys and like. Yeah, there are, yeah. There, so there are two that are kind of sequels to Little Women. There's one called Little Men and Joe's Boys that kind of let her write about boys more. Um, she could, she has a lot of the same characters continue. Again, this kind of, we think about all your best friends. It's just like fantasy wish fulfillment where like she starts a school and Lori lives next door. Like it's very, <laughs> I think, she, I think there were things she enjoyed about that fiction. I do think towards the end of her life, she got, she felt kind of trapped as a quote unquote children's writer. But uh, I, I think she felt, found ways to do some of the things she wanted to do, like write about boys more. (laughs) Which is interesting. But also I think, and this is why I was asking some of my American friends, I'm like, people are into little women, but, and I think like that book is so popular. I, my impression is people like, I love this book so much. I'm going to read the next one. And they're like, (laughs) like, this isn't, I don't, I don't think I do. Cause it's like, well, no, do do you want to read about Joe being an adult woman and Running a right. boys' school, not necessarily like you want to read about her as a young yes. person. Like those characters is what people exactly. love. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, but, I agree. Well, even like the Anne of Green Gables books, I know so many people. I'm in Canada who are fans of those books, <laughs> and they they read all of them. But by the end, it's like Anne's daughter. It's like Anne is. It's like less people read as the books go on because it's like well, I don't really want to read about Anne Shirley being like a stay at home mom. Like this isn't that's not. Yeah, no, it's like TV shows that go on for three too many seasons. It's tricky, right? Everyone's making so much money that it's yeah. hard to say no. Yeah. But like these characters are aging. It's not like the Babysitter's Club or something where they're always 12. Uh, anyway, so throughout all of this, Louisa, so she's tending to her parents and stuff. And she's also 
living with these chronic health issues. And then her, who Anna's husband dies, right? Yes. Yeah. So Lisa Malcolm is like, oh my gosh, like now I need to support like my sister's family because you know there's not a man in that family. So this is where she wrote Little Men. She's like, oh, I'll just, yeah, let's do another sequel. She wrote that, so quote, that John's death may not leave Anna and the dear little boys in want. So which is sweet. Like she was like, okay, I'll write this sequel for that reason. This is getting into a lot of like, she went here, she went here, she wrote some stuff. But here it says, fame was not what she had imagined as a child. Most upsetting was the disruption of her privacy. People sought her autograph and company regularly stopping by Orchard House. Which, I mean, to people now, celebrities, like it's relatable to be like, I wrote these books and I'm glad you love it, but please don't like take pictures of my children with long lens cameras while we're... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so like that's just not... Plus, but again, I'm not saying like, and then the next 20 years were sad. It's like, no, she like, yeah, no, but, but the, I'm, I'm reminded of where we were in the beginning of the conversation where she was someone that liked to be alone. She likes to be with her family. She likes to write. Um, so I don't think the celebrity part, I mean, she, she did continue in political activism. Like, so she worked for women, women's suffrage and was kind of hilariously impatient with people that were not on board. So she was doing lots of other things, but I think the, um, Yeah, the idea of fans showing up at her door was not something, not something she was looking for. No, and I don't, Frank, like, especially her, she liked being alone. But like, who wants that? No one wants that. That's like quite distressing to anyone. Yeah, you have to be a complete narcissist if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, if if you want people coming to your door. Anyway, so she's like 10 years of parents and then her mother um, passed away. And so this is leaving, um, let's see, they buried Abba next to Beth in Concord. Yeah in the cemetery. Um, and then obviously this is tragic to them. Her dad is still there. Um, I think the mother, like I said earlier, like the Louisa's writing was, um, the glue that kept the family together, but I think Abba was, well, no person could be removed from a family unit without it falling apart. But I think Abba was a real glue in this family, just sort of giving them direction and support and love. So they're just, so she grew closer to her father because the, the sisters are gone. It's kind of just the two of them. And then her sister May, who is like Amy, she married a Swiss businessman. So yeah, so because because Amy's a painter over in Europe um, at at the time. I don't know how interested people are going to be in this. At the time, a very respected genre of painting was actually copying paintings. Um, it you know now we would see that as like unoriginal and not real art. Um, and so she was living over in Europe and met this guy and had a baby. But then um, probably from complications from childbirth died a couple weeks after the baby's born. So then this, is this Lulu? Is that? that yes. Baby? Yeah. Who was named for Louisa called Lulu and Louisa May Alcott sort of adopted or like very much was involved in the raising of this child. Yeah. They bring the, so the baby's born in Europe. They somehow bring Lulu over on a boat and Louisa becomes her parent as Louisa would probably say, her father. And anyway, so like she was, Louisa was going through it, going through it. Like what a lot of people of that age, I'm assuming she's like in her 50s-ish by now, 40s, 50s, but she's caring for her aging parents. Like people are, are there's babies are coming into the thing and she's just kind of like, thank God, you know, little women, like the money is still helping support the family. But I think also, so she's not writing as much at this point. She doesn't need to, right? Right. Yes. Which is good because she has this, you know, horrible arthritis and things. Let's see. Yeah. So Lulu arrived. Here it says, um, at year's end, whatever year this is, um, 1879, Louisa only had one publication, but finances were no longer pivotal. She had invested well. Love it. Yeah. Again, savvy, savvy business person. Absolutely. Yeah. So she was not only making money, but she was like handling it very well, which is great. So. Elcott finally seemed happy to have a reason for living that did not center on making money. I don't know, but like raising Lulu. Which is, uh, which is fair, I think. Yeah. Again, it, it, it doesn't have to be either or. The, I mean, it does seem like she maybe was writing stuff that was less interesting to her at the end of her career, but she'd been working so hard for so long that, um, you know, it's hard to sort of indict her for not writing different kinds of novels at the end of her life. Yeah. Well, no, it's like she deserves to not... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's this is a whole other conversation, but just like the still present 
societal expectation that everyone should be working all the time or else you're wasting your no you don't if you don't need to work and you don't want to work you shouldn't have to absolutely yeah so then, you know, Lulu is is there with her. It says here, Lulu was a happy and strong-willed child, which I appreciate. Maybe there's a little <laughs> bit of, of Lou in Lulu. Her father had a stroke. He was paralyzed. He couldn't speak. And so uh, Louisa May Alcott returned home to care for him and then began work on Joe's Boys. So the last of the trilo- what became a trilogy about the March family. And then she also set to work editing her letters and journals. So to publish some of her other writing. And that's like a lot of writers do at this point in their career, I think, just to be like, my collected writing. Like, she's famous enough as a person. People are coming to her door. It's like, okay, here, like, I'll just publish my, like, diaries. And then knowing her father's end was near, she traveled to Boston to visit him. The following day, she wrote her final diary entry. Better in mind, but food a little uneasy is part of what it says. And then her father passed away on March 4th. And then Louisa passed away on March 6th, age 55. Yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, not not that old. You figure her dad, I forget how old Bronson is when he's, he died, but a lot older than her. So yeah. So but I mean, she had this illness for so long as well. That, yeah. She left her family like well endowed. So just so Anna and the boys received the bulk of the estate with a provision for Lulu. Um, who was sent back to Europe to live with her father. And so Orchard House became a museum and a memorial for Louisa May Alcott. Anna oversaw it until her death, and then the responsibility went to her sons. And I think at that point, like at the point where Louisa May Alcott became famous, like already there was sort of this public relations happening to, to not let people know that she was secretly this kind of like cranky asshole and then I think <laughs> Anna, like I say with all love, I appreciate that about her. Um, and I think Anna and the trustees of the estate also just like Orchard House, it's where little women, like they knew that this is what people want. Yeah. They wanted to be this like, oh, this nice lady who's kind of like Mother Goose who wrote this nice story, not this kind of like cranky, opinionated person. So this sort of authorly persona persisted. Well, and I like I like your phrase of public relations, too, because this idea, again, um, that the woman most famous writing the most famous b- American book about girls, like maybe didn't want to be a girl. Right. That's maybe a little bit off public relations. Um, and, and this is not unusual to happen to um, American writers who um, send off queer vibes in some way. Like, so she's going to get made over into what they call the children's friend. But someone like Walt Whitman, the, probably the most famous American poet who was absolutely gay, um, he's, his biography is going to get sanitized as well by historians and critics are just like, no, that can't be true. He was easily in love with a woman, like this, that, and the other thing. And he's turned into the good, great poet. I mean, so I, th- I, I, th- I think you're right about like making the estate seem sort of more coherent, right? The, her sort of intellectual property. But also uh, the other thing that's interesting about Al- Alcott and Whitman is they're, they're writing all these kind of revolutionary things like right before the birth of modern psychology and like what, what, uh, what they call sex, sexology, like where they kind of invent the categories of these sort of binary categories of straight gay. And so they're kind of writing in these ways that, later are going to get pathologized. So when people are sort of poking into their papers in the early 20th century, it's like, oh no, like they can't be that, right? That would ruin them. Well, I'm just thinking about like, okay, for instance, that just the position, like you said, that she's uh, a woman, so she's 55 when she dies, but like a woman of that age, like she was a spinster when she was 25. Like she was a woman who never married. And that to society at the time was like, "Mm, that's weird. So to sort of retrofit that and to be like, oh, she was just this kind of nicely, like, to like, you don't want to be like, oh, oh, it's because she was queer. Oh, it's because whatever. It's just like, she's a, a nice lady who never married. So I've been recently watching um, Miss Marple, the TV movies about the Agatha Christie character. And what was really interesting to me, these are versions from the early 2000s. And Miss Marple, who is this like, canonically like old lady who never married and in these tv series they're like oh but she did have a love in world war one and then they had to part and i'm like why are you putting this in here why do you have to be like she's not gay 
Don't worry about Miss yeah. Miracle. She was in love once. Exactly. And in, 18, in 1860, you might not have had to say that. That isn't to say people didn't desire people of the same sex in 1860, but we didn't have those categories in the same way. By 1900, you're absolutely going to be like, not gay. Yeah. <laughs> not gay, not gay, not gay, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just to have Louisa May Alcott as, uh, I don't know, it's also interesting too. I did, I interviewed a woman a bit ago about her novel about um, Lucy Maud Montgomery, who's also like beloved author of a beloved property. And she did marry and she had children, but she was very unhappy and it was kind of a really challenging marriage. So just, I don't know, just the the real life of the authors of these books that are so, that are children's books. So like, of course the children's books aren't going to reflect the like mental health status of the author because they're meant to be nice stories. But just the fact that people then conflate to assume that the authors are just like, do, 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 everything's great. I'm the author of children's books. Like I never had a struggle. It's interesting. Absolutely. So I just remembered that I haven't given you a heads up about this, but we need to score Louisa May Alcott on the scale with which I end every episode (laughs) of my podcast. And I'm interested to see what you say about this because she's a different sort of person from who we have often talked about. So there's four categories and it's all a scale of zero to 10. So I'm going to just as the expert, I will let you (laughs) take the lead. So the first category is scandaliciousness. How, and this is like how scandalous was this person seen by people at the time? So as an example of somebody with high scandaliciousness would be like, I don't know, Cleopatra or somebody like that who was just like, oh my gosh, look at what she's doing. So Louisa May Alcott, like not married, doing the like, you know, her family abolition. Like, so there was some stuff that people just be like, what's this person doing? So like on a scale of zero to 10, where would you put her? Yeah. So that, that sounds maybe like mid, like the, I think the politics stuff would, would be, I don't know, maybe get her to a four or a five, yeah. but like her, per, her, her personal life was made like the way she lived her life was maybe l- less radical than some of the characters she wrote, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause it, it, you know, she, you know, dressed in women's clothing most of the time went by her feminine name, worked on women's causes um, probably cause options, other options were not available to her, but I know you're interested, you're interested in class on this podcast too. And part of this is like it, it, other options that sometimes are taken by other scandalous women is they have the option to be scandalous yeah. because they've got resources. But so yeah, maybe not super scandalous. I don't know what you would say. I think I think a five is where I would put her, I think for sure. But I'm just something you just said, you said she dressed in women's clothes most of the time. What did she do the rest of the time? And what were those times? Well, this is the sort of like th- those situations where there's more leeway. So if you're going to go for like a big long walk through the woods, right? Or she's performing in amateur theatricals, or she still was sort of taking opportunities to wear men's clothing in places where it was possible. Yeah. No, but you're right. The classing is such a part of it. And that's why I have like these different categories so people can score highly in different places. Because there are who like... I don't know specifically if it's at the same time, but in the 19th century in Paris, is there's like George Sand and there's like authors who like are living this very outre, yes. like pants wearing life. But that's a different place and that they don't yeah, have to- Yeah, and, and you need money to do that. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have to be the person, like the single breadwinner for an extended family and aging parents. Like she, yeah, Louisa did what she could. The next category, and I'm going to define it for you. So it's scheminess, which doesn't necessarily mean like, haha, an evil scheme, but just like a person with a plan who knows what they're doing and does it on purpose. So it can also be sort of, yeah, just someone who like has a plan for their life and executes it and it does well. And I think, I think she did that actually with her writing and the savviness. Yeah. I'd rate her pretty high for that. I mean, how many of us have a a dream as a preteen to be a famous author and then they become one? Like... That's pretty schemey. Well, and the fact that she she was like, okay, I got this story published, but like, oh, but if I wrote it like this, then I could maybe get $20 for it instead of 10. Like, oh, if I wrote a children's book, I'll get, like she did it in a very deliberate way, which I respect. Yeah, yeah. and the, I'm going to go back to her as a sort of a savvy author who was good in many genres. Like one of the things critics like to argue about is which stuff, which, which of her writing counts as her real feelings, right? The, the, the scandalous stuff is just for money, but Little Women is real. Little Women is just for money, but the scandal stuff is real. What if it's all real? What if like, what if she's just a really good writer and yeah. can write in lots of different genres? Give her some credit. 
Yeah. So what would you say on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of like being a person with a plan? I don't know, maybe, maybe an eight or a nine. I'm going to go with a nine, I think. You know, that reminds me of what you were just saying about like, which is the real her? It's like, um, sometimes people say that about singers where they're like, Britney Spears is real voice. And it's like, well, no, she's a singer and she sings in this style sometimes. And she sings in this style. So they're like, the record labels made her change her voice. It's like, no, it's like when she's singing a gospel song, she sounds like this. And when she's singing a pop song, she sounds like this. Like both can be true. It's not like. Right. And, and most art is even things like even novels. Most art is a collaboration amongst a bunch of different people and factors. So like movies are the ones with the most voices, right? Because you've got like thousands of people involved. But even books that are published, right? They've, you've got market pressures. You've got like how much time and money does the person have to write it? Do they have an editor? What does the publisher want? And that's true for almost all art. It's rare that someone just makes something that becomes famous with no kind of interaction with the culture around them. No, exactly. And when people do, we see recently, rarely some weird examples of that, like, like where something becomes like a fan fiction suddenly hits the mainstream or something. And then you see like, well, that's purely this person's voice, I guess. But at the same time, it's drawn, it's derived from an original intellectual property. So right. it's already, it's, anyway, you're right. I don't know. I, I think that's a really important distinction to make. Like just because somebody is writes in different ways and is successful doesn't mean that they're like evil or it's not, the art isn't yeah, yeah. pure or whatever. It's like everybody's influenced by something. Yeah, no, you, yeah, you used the word sell out earlier too, yeah. right? Again, the, the reminder is she's writing in a whole bunch of genres together all along. So it's not as if she keeps switching it up or something. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. So the next category is, here's an interesting one, significance. So how is the person... Are they remembered today? What is the effect? I think this is going to be a very high number just because yeah, yeah. the book has never been out of print. You know, the house is a museum. How many books like my friend Amanda's book, Belittled Women, which everyone should read. But like every year there's a new adaptation of Little Women, like a new movie or a new book. Like it's permeated the cultural consciousness. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. It's like an industry now. Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. would say 10 for that. I think 10 for significance as well. Definitely. And then this is an interesting one. So the final category is what I call, it's the sexism bonus. And this is kind of here for what I'm talking about, not specifically a Louise Mayalka type person, but if there's somebody who um, could have achieved more, if not for the patriarchy of their time, you know, if somebody who was like, I don't know, some princess, and then she tried to run away with her lover, and then they trapped her in a castle for 25 years. It's like, how, right. how much more could Louise May Alcott have achieved if without living in a sexist society. And I don't know, because I think she found a way to thrive within one. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I almost think like rating, like ideas of success might come in here. Like how do you define success? Like I feel like as a person, had she like existed in her own time, I think like her life would be really different, right? Like if I'm, if me and other people are right about her longing, not just for masculinity, but for maleness, you know, she might be able to be a man. But um, in terms of literary success, she sort of made a career out of like skewering sexism, right? So <laughs> that's a tricky one. Well, and it's tricky because, yeah, it's like, okay, so an example of someone who would get a very high score in this would be somebody who wanted to be a writer but could never be published because they were a woman. But she right. found a way, like even under her own name too. So I don't know. I don't, I don't feel, I feel like the patriarchy always holds everyone back a bit. So I would say, if we're not sure, we'll just say a five because I'm sure. Yeah, because I feel like she might be in the category of someone like Virginia Woolf too, right? Who was a genius, but like kept talking about wanting a room of her own with a lock on the door, right? Yeah. I wonder, I do wonder what Alcott would have written if she'd had a room of her own and a lock on the door, right? Well, and also if she, yeah, and if she hadn't, well, and this isn't specifically sexism, but it is a bit, I, like if she hadn't been <laughs> the, the sole breadwinner for her entire family, which right. she, she wouldn't have had to have been if women could have had more jobs and if ABBA didn't have to stay right. home and watch the children like that yeah yeah or if she'd been able to go to college right like none yeah. of they did none of them went to college it's, it was almost impossible for women to go to college that's true and you said like her stories she wrote about them where she's like you know it's not my favorite but I did get better at dialogue it's like she was doing her own MFA through writing yeah. stories <laughs> that were published yeah on her own yeah yeah okay so let me see so I just need to do some quick math that gets her a score of 29 which in terms of this podcast is like more than respectable. I'm just seeing. 
Who else is, oh, you know what? You know who else is a 29? Mary Shelley. So. That, that's a great comparison. Yeah. That's a great comparison. She loved, yeah. I mean, I think she was a bigger fan of the Brontes, but she definitely had read, she had read Shelley too. Yeah. Well, I haven't done the Brontes yet, but yeah. And I think both of them, it's interesting that they, in terms of significance, like the literary significance of both of their works, like there's, I'm, you are a, professor of English literature. So you know a lot more things. But um, in terms of just the everyday person, like everyone knows Frankenstein. Everyone yes. knows Little Women. Like, and then I don't know, like maybe A Christmas Carol or something is a book by a man that, or like Huckleberry Finn. I don't know. But like there's, I don't know how many other books of from the 19th century are as famous and as read today and enjoyed as Frankenstein and Little Women, really. I agree. I was going to say, I was going to say Moby Dick until you said read and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so every everyone sort of knows the story of Moby Dick, but very few people read it and not as many people as should enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. So I think the significance, I love that. I love that she and Mary Shelley are both there in the same neighborhood. So before we go, I just want, so if people are interested in you and your writing and what you're up to, do you have any, do you have a website or anything that people can keep up with what you're doing or? Um, I'm, I'm not really on social media for this kind of stuff. You certainly could, uh, you, you can, uh, look at where I teach and my research interests at the um, website for, uh, SUNY Geneseo, which is www.geneseo, G-E-N-E-S-E-O.edu. If someone wants to find me that way, a lot of my articles are behind um, stupid journal paywalls. Um, but if someone finds something of mine they want to read, you're welcome to email me and I can send you a PDF. So, Yeah, I do want to say that I, I had to use um, secret means to acquire access to the, the article that I read of yours. That's totally fine with me because as you may or may not know, right, um, academic writers don't get paid at all for their work. So uh, I would encourage people to find them in other ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for talking to you. I was so looking forward to this conversation. It was even more fun than I thought it was going to be. This was really delightful. Thanks to you so much for the invitation. So one of the things, Alice was here um, just sharing her expertise. She doesn't have a, a book specifically for me to mention, but I will mention again, uh, a novel that came up while we were talking, which is Belittled Women, which is a young adult novel by my friend Amanda Soleil. And if you're interested in, you know, alternate readings of Little Women, that's a, it's a, it's a fun read. Anyway, Belittled Women by Amanda Soleil is my recommendation of the day. And if you want to keep up with Vulgar History and with me, so we have a website, which is vulgarhistory.com. And if you go there, the recent episodes have got transcripts done by Aveline Malik of The Wordery. Thank you so much, Aveline, for doing those for us. And then also on that website, vulgarhistory.com, there's a contact form. So if you have suggestions, like Ali did, about looking at Louisa May Alcott through a trans-affirming lens, you know, send me a message there. Or you can also email me at vulgarhistorypod at gmail.com. I'm also on social media, most active. You can find me always putting silly memes and polls and questions on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod. I'm also on TikTok at Vulgar History. And I have merch, goofy ass merch. Uh, most recently, um, I have, uh, you're listening to this and it's October. And so there is a sort of Halloween adjacent thing. My my frequent collaborator, Jan Uvater, knocked it out of the park with this one. It's a picture of the ghost of John Knox saying, whores, which if you listen to the Mary Queen of Scots episodes I did, you'll know why he's doing that. Anyway, you can get John Knox whores merch, um, t-shirts, stickers, etc. And also other other merch based on other people we've talked about. So that's all at um, vulgarhistory.com slash store. It takes you to the Tee Public store, which is best for U.S. shipping. Or if you're living not in the U.S., then vulgarhistory.redbubble.com has some better shipping for you with all the same products as well. I also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Ann Foster Writer, where if you pledge at least $1 or more a month, you get early ad-free access to all episodes. And if you pledge $5 or more a month, you get early ad-free access as well as access to the Vulgar History Discord, which is like a group chat for the Tits Out Brigade. Also at that $5 or more a month level, you get access to bonus episodes of Vulgar Peace Theater, where we review costume dramas in like three and a half hour long minutia level discussions. 
as well as episodes of So This Asshole and So These Messy Bitches, just talking about, you know, dirtbags of history, not to steal a word, copyrighted by Alison Epstein. Anyway, thank you all for listening to this podcast. And until next time, my friends, you know, like Louise Malcott, keep your pants on. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent V.B. Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law, her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts.